Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Eli Sopo. What kind of a doctor am I? Well, don't cough because I can't fix you. Don't bend over because I'm not going to help you there either. I'm what's called a systemologist. What the heck is that, you might be asking? Well, I look at systems and I look how humans and organizations interconnect. So, what we're going to look at is why some systems work well and some, well, not so good. One of the things you've heard about probably is that, oh what, 70, 80, 90 percent of change management efforts fail in an organization. Do you ever think about that? Ever think about why that is happening? Let me give you a hint. Many organizations look just like this clock. A clock works. Tick tock, tick tock, everything on time, everything predictable, everything the way it should be. As a matter of fact, there are many people in the past, real professionals, who used to say that the whole universe is like a clockworks. People like Isaac Newton, people like people who like Frederick Taylor, for example, who invented scientific management. They all thought that organizations are much like a clock, predictable, on time, and easily manipulated. So when we look at organizations, are they really like a clockworks? Do people really need to be put into a slot? Is that how it works? Do all the employees in your workplace, are they, are they interchangeable parts in your machine? Of course not. We're human beings. What your organization really looks like is more like, well, a slinky toy. It's like this. It's moving, it's up and down, it shifts its patterns. But you know what? It stays within a certain kind of uh, de definition of how it looks and how it fits. It's got boundaries to it. A slinky has boundaries, but it's always shifting and difficult to predict. So you might say, well that's just great. How does this help my planning? How does it help my organization deal with change? One thing you can consider is a new science, about 20-30 years old, that's called complexity science. Complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems look at the world of organizations much like a natural system, interconnected parts, like the biology of the world that we live in, constantly changing, things that are emerging and growing. Complexity science look at it, looks at an organization not like a clock works, but more like a, well, a flower, something that's growing and blossoming and developing. There was a guy what's called uh, Ralph Stacy who used to say that farmers don't grow wheat. They create the conditions for the wheat to grow. So we're going to look at complexity science as a way for you to help your organization have the conditions it needs to grow and adapt and kind of survive in a very changing environment. Every field of science usually has its own specialized language and of course complexity science does too. We're going to go over a few basic points, about six of them, that will tell you what complexity is all about. First of all, there's what's called a good enough vision. As you know, in traditional strategic planning, a lot of detail goes into where you're going to go in the next three to four or five years. Very detailed work, very carved in stone goals and objectives. Complexity science says that's impossible. It is impossible to predict into the future what you're going to be like within an organization that is facing constant change. This is not something new. Back in 1960, there was a meteorologist called Edward Lorenz who discovered, wait for this, that it's impossible to predict the weather. <laughs> well, according to the mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz, he discovered something in chaos theory, which is kind of a cousin to complexity science. What Edward Lorenz discovered was that the smallest change to a formula a large formula, a mathematical formula, even the tiniest change could change the end result. The fancy word for that is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. In other words, one thing that changes in your whole pattern of behavior and your forecasting could eventually out change the outcome. So the idea of, of a, in fact, when he did his beautiful work on a mathematical model, it looked like a butterfly. And you may have heard something called the butterfly effect. And that is from Edward Lorenz and basically it means that the tiniest thing could change the end result. The old saying is, can a butterfly 
in South America flap its wings and create a thunderstorm in Texas? Who knows? Could be. So a good enough vision in, in the complexity language says start off with broad goals. Don't carve them in stone. Be prepared to adapt as things changed around you. Rather than giving people very uh, delineated, very careful, very carved in stone instructions again, top-down kind of management, complexity talks about minimum specifications. So in other words, we want to get there over the next five years. Here's some basic parameters that we'd like you to work with, come up with some creativity and some ideas. Minimum specifications, a good enough vision to get there. That allows the kind of adaptation and kind of creativity that is so embedded in complexity science. Out of the minimum specifications comes something called self-organization. Get a bunch of people together, yourself and other employees, understand where the big goal is that you're trying to achieve, talk about the kind of things that are necessary to get there, the minimum specifications, be creative, and out of that comes self-organization. You talk, you share, you collaborate, you communicate, and out of that emerges something quite different. Brenda Zimmerman, a, a tremendous person in the field of complexity science, talks about wicked questions. We all know about the elephant in the room. That's the thing we don't want to talk about. Don't ask the questions because, well, it's on everybody's mind, but don't ask the question. No, Brenda Zimmerman says, ask the wicked questions. Why are we doing this? Why don't we do this? Who says? How come? What's with this? You've got to ask the questions that's on everybody's mind if you're really going to emerge into something different and better. Shadow systems are from Ralph Stacey. Stacey he's a tremendous uh, scholar in the field of complexity science. And what Ralph Stacey talks about is that here's your organizational system. This is how we do things every day. These are the rules. These are the regulations. These are the processes. These are the systems. Follow your rules. Fine. How many organizations really work like that? Not too many. Many organizations, according to Ralph Stacey, have shadow systems. In other words, you know what? These rules aren't going to help us get to where we're going. What the heck with them? Let's do something different. Let's do something creative in the shadows and get where we're supposed to be going to get some victory and to get some, some positive results. The good thing about shadow systems when you're doing complexity science is to ask about them. Talk to employees. Look at the systems and processes. Are people following the rules and regulations that are carved in stone and strangle them in red tape? Or should they say, what the heck are those rules? I've got a better way of doing it. Let's do it this way, but keep it in the shadows. Discover what's in the shadows, move it into the light, and you're going to enhance the systems that you have to give you the kind of positive results that you need. Of course, out of that now comes emergence. Emergence comes from complex adaptive systems when you have a good enough vision, you get people together and just give them a few minimum specifications so they can use their creativity, they self-organize, they ask wicked questions, they bring the shadow systems out into the open and you get emergence. It's a wonderful way of doing things. So, we've been talking about the language of complexity. And we've also been talking about the language of a mechanistic kind of workforce. You know what I'm talking about. You hear words like re-engineering. Well, what does that do? Do you think people are just cogs on a wheel? Of course we're not going to re-engineer them. What complexity does is looks at regrowing the organization. It is not a mechanical metaphor, it is an organic one. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Ta-da! This is your traditional organization chart. Top down, lots of uh, little boxes that everybody fits into. Yeah, it's, it's... And, as my good gentleman has just explained, when you look at an organization chart like this, it tends to bend around and twist. It, you know, it's crazy. So this is, you can never keep an organization looking like some kind of a military battlefield. An organization is full of people with emotions and who want to connect. This kind of an organization, a traditional organization chart, is really called silos of excellence. Little groups of people locked in boxes, thinking they're doing a great job, but never being in touch with anybody else. There's a great woman called Karen Stephenson, a PhD in, in both uh, biology and uh, anthropology and business administration. 
She makes a career out of going to huge organizations like IBM and others and looking how they interconnect. She doesn't come up with this. She comes up with this, more like the complexity org chart. What Karen Stephenson has found is that the power doesn't lie in an org chart. You have to see how people interconnect, how they share information, how they communicate, how they cooperate, who really has the power. So really it's overlapping circles, different units, different groups, different individuals coming together to work in a very organic way. As a matter of fact, Karen Stephenson will tell us that you look at an org chart like this and you think the president at the top has all the power. Not necessarily. It could very well be a research assistant way down here who knows where everything is, knows where the people are, and has the kind of information that you need on a daily basis. So this is what complexity looks like. Overlapping circles, working together, a complex adaptive system. Let me show you one more thing. This is bioleadership. Ta-da! What is bioleadership? It's a term I came up with in 1990 where I had a cover story published. Once again, you can see how in bioleadership things rock around a bit, they move constantly in motion. Or maybe that's just a chart. In bioleadership, there are six really key uh, principles. You guide, you don't decree. In other words, you bring people together and you offer leadership that is guiding, not telling people what to do. You emphasize before advancing. In other words, you, you look at people, you look at the situation, and you feel what's going on. There's empathy. You understand people. You understand yourself as well before you advance with a solution that nobody else is really uh, bought into at that time. You understand the inside before demanding from the outside. What does that mean? It means understand yourself first before you start demanding from other people. Until you truly understand yourself, your emotions, your drivers, why you do the things you do, you'll never really be able to achieve success. Just a demand from the outside without understanding your own self won't be a very successful path. Wage peace, not war. Our life is full of warfare words. You know, we're going to attack the opposition. We're going to destroy the enemy. This is not a battlefield. These are organizations working together. These are people working together. Why would we use the language of warfare to describe other people and other groups? Because unfortunately when we do that, our brain, the neurology of our brain, literally sees us attacking somebody when we simply use the word, let's attack them. No. Wage peace instead. Use metaphors and bring people together and talk about collaboration, talk about co cooperation. Weave networks, don't cut ties. Complexity science talks about interrelated uh, groups of people, interrelated issues, working together to achieve a solution. Now, you might think this is some kind of crunchy granola, crazy stuff invented in Vancouver, British Columbia. I could see you thinking that. Let me give you a quote. It's a fantastic book, of course it's mine, Corporate Personality Disorder. So, if you think that complexity science is all about crunchy granola kind of, you know, weird organizations, here's one. The United States Marine Corps. Now, I don't think that's a crunchy granola organization, and here's what they say in their Command and Control Manual Number MCDP6. This is from the U.S. Marine Corps. Like a living organism, a military organization is never in a state of stable equilibrium. Instead, it is in a continuous state of flux, continually adjusting to its surroundings. Command and control is not so much a matter of one part of the organization getting control of another as it is something that connects all the elements together in a cooperative fashion. The United States Marine Corps. I once interviewed a lieutenant, a woman, with the United States Marine Corps in the planning department. Her words to me, she said, you know, we don't talk about command and control. I said, well, this is the military. Oh, you must have command and control. She said, no, we have command and coordinate. Of course we need a command structure. People need to know where they're going, what they're doing, and who's in charge. But to control something like a war is impossible. Of course it is. But we can coordinate our activities 
and we could collaborate on outcomes. Brilliant thinking from, from the young lieutenant. So, here's the deal. If the United States Marine Corps could adapt complexity science in the way it manages a war, don't you think your organization that manages perhaps something not quite so volatile can also benefit from complexity science? Absolutely it can. You also want to look at channeling, not damning opinion. There's some organizations in that mechanistic model who says, you know what, we don't like your opinion, so we're going to put a big rock right in front of you. I don't want to hear about it. Putting a big rock in terms of opinion is like putting a rock in a fast-flowing stream. I don't want, we're going to block it. Let's put a rock there. What happens? It goes round or over top. That's what happens with complexity science. Leadership in complexity science is something quite different. It's appreciating that you can't have all the answers, that good enough planning can work, and also that the role of the people within your organization are hugely important. Let me give you another quote. This one is from a man called Jim Taylor. I actually met him in Philadelphia once uh, at a complexity science conference. Jim Taylor uh, at that time was head of a huge hospital. He had just come in as the chief executive officer, a big fan of complexity science. They asked him to create a strategic plan. Here's what Jim Taylor said. There's liberation about saying that nobody has the answer, that nobody can have the answer. I can make a difference in doing the best I can. That's an important recognition for me to make, for anybody to make for themselves. That doesn't mean I don't feel anxious at times, I do. So, I'd say it's not a matter of whether you're anxious or not, it's a matter of dealing with your anxiety. He understood it's important to look at yourself before you look at the outside, that good enough planning was better than very tightly prescriptive planning, and ultimately that when you bring people together, they're going to find some solutions on their own. How did he do? Tremendously well. The hospital is extremely profitable, but more than just profitable. The patient care he provided went up 30 and 40 and 50 percent over a few years. So, that's complexity science. Not too complicated. Actually quite simple, but it is a change in the way we think.